Coming up next on Tech News Today, Samsung is working on a bendable phone and it bends into a tablet. Also, the social stigma of using voice assistants out in public. Uh, Microsoft's unreleased and super simplistic note-taking app, the ethical and moral complications of autonomous vehicles, and finally, a fish that spits what it spits at may surprise you. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1529, recorded Tuesday, June 7th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by PillPack, a full-service online pharmacy that combines modern technology, convenient packaging, and personalized service to make your life easier. Visit PillPack.com slash twit to save $20 on vitamins and OTCs when you transfer your prescriptions. And by Trunk Club. Get clothes that fit and look amazing without ever stepping into a store again. Trunk Club will help you create the wardrobe you've always dreamed of. With your own personal stylist. Go to trunkclub.com slash TNT and join Trunk Club today. And by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you fresh, high-quality ingredients to cook delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. This is Tech News Today, the show where we talk about all of the technology news with people who are passionate about that very technology news. Mm -hmm. I am Megan Maroney. And I'm Jason Howell. Passionate uh, 7.58 8 out of 10 today, that, I think. That's where you are? I think. I think it's going to increase as the show goes on. I think. I hope so. Yeah, I, I believe <laughs> that it will. Uh, joining us today is uh, Brad Sams from Petri.com. How's it going, Brad? Great. How's it going with you all? It's it's <laughs> awesome to have you here. Um, we've had you on, I think, a couple of times, like in an interview uh, capacity yes, yes, for, for different stories here and there. So it's great to get you on for the full show. Thanks mm -hmm. for joining us. And you just uh, came back you. from vacation. Oh, I jerk. did, and it's it's actually my daughter's birthday today, a vacation. And it's all it's all falling down today. <laughs> <laughs> How were you on using your technology on vacation? Were you good about it or not so good? I was terrible. I worked every day. You can't get away from this stuff. I mean, much probably like you guys, it's not really work, right? You enjoy this. You read about it. It's There's no truly escaping. When the kid goes to bed and, and it's late at night, and you just kind of hop on and uh, you know take care of business and, and catch up. Yeah, it's kind of part of the routine, and it's really hard to break that routine, even when you are stepping away. I should know. I went camping, and I still checked my email. Right. I should not do that next time. <laughs> I guess that's what it is. It's passion. That's what passion uh, yeah. looks like. Passion about passion technology. Passion or addiction to technology. It's one of those things. They're easily confused. Uh, let's talk about a few news stories today. First up, Samsung has been toying around with bendable screens for a few years now. Turns out... We might finally see a Samsung phone that actually folds based on that technology and not just the curved edges that we've already seen in the Galaxy S6 and S7 Edge devices. Sources told Bloomberg that one model folds in half like a cosmetic uh, compact and another would fold out from a 5-inch smartphone into an 8-inch tablet. Samsung actually showed off a video concept in 2014 that seems to demonstrate what this might uh, be like. I believe it's the, Kara, if you take a look at the doc, I think it's the first YouTube link on this story. And I've got it queued up so you can kind of see a little bit about, there you go. It was like, it was a tablet at first and then it folded up. And man, this video is like the most cheesy, like <laughs> cheese filled video I think I've ever That's seen. That's from 2014? Yes, it's from 2014. This was like a concept video that they were showing off uh, related to their foldable uh kind of screen technology there you see it as a tablet so i don't know if this is what they're working on but i don't know what do you think this is definitely a different idea right a, a convertible tablet down to a phone uh size uh definitely different i mean apple you know had the foldable iphone a couple of years ago the bendable iphone anyways uh so you know maybe samsung's just copying <laughs> apple again i can't get over that video the, yeah. the woman who's like, let me see your oh, technology, man, we didn't even, hand it over. We didn't even hear it, okay? Because, like, the beauty is is in the dialogue, which is I don't, I don't is think just, I want to hear it. I, it. It's pretty bad. <laughs> it's, it's kind of uncomfortable. Also, the, the what's the continuing need to compare technology to compacts? 
Like, that is, <laughs> clearly comes from a man. No woman calls it a compact, just to yeah, be it clear. Does. Like, you're not saying, where's my compact? I took that from the article, <laughs> by know. the way. That, or the source, did. rather. <laughs> that wasn't my words. Brad, what do you think about this? Is uh, foldable, you know, phones into tablets, is this the next wave of smart smart devices? So, so let me ask you guys a question about this. Have you ever wanted a larger screen phone? Yes, absolutely. I mean... Like on the go, because here's like, I think the foldable idea is neat and interesting. I'll be real curious to see how it works in practicality, yeah. because one of the one of the issues we've run into is that, yes, apps are great. We love apps on our iPhones and our Androids. And the problem is, is they never really scaled up well. And so when you go to that bigger display is the app, as long as the app scales up and you get more functionality out of it, that's great. But if, the, if it opens up and it's the exact same app, you're not really going to gain anything. So right. I hope that Samsung is actually going to bring something with this that when you when you like for email example, if you open it up and got a larger keyboard and a better experience, I think that really could be uh, a very compelling offer. But if it's just quite literally the Android email app just scaled up, then I, I'm not so sold on it. Um, I think this is going to be one of those things just like every other piece of tech. First few iterations are a little rough. And if we can actually get there, then, you know, you're looking like the third generation before this is a really compelling offer. But let's see what they got. I mean, you know, Samsung uh, has been struggling a little bit in the smartphones um, sales wise. They're, they're trying to get back into that innovation mode, I guess. And, you know, I'll be curious to see what they got. Yeah, I know with Android, um, it, you know, depending on the side of the screen, it will either you know be in phone mode or in tablet kind of UI, and that's a signal that's right. sent to the app that if the developers have done their job uh, correctly, they've basically told you know the OS when the screen is below this uh, below this size, serve up the phone UI. When it's above this size, serve up the tablet UI, and that ends up actually you know fitting the screen better. It's not just a blown up phone version, mm -hmm. but it actually kind of formats differently. So yeah, I, you're right. I would hope that if if this actually comes to you know comes to be true in 2017, which is what sources are saying they're targeting right now, um, that they would treat it responsibly in that way. And it's Samsung, so I'm pretty sure that they would. I'm sure that it would also have a lot of their their enhancements. Uh, yeah. The well. other unknown, too, would be how it impacts battery life. I think we all, sure. at least in my opinion, I'm okay. Phones don't need to get any thinner. I, I would just want that battery life to last more than 24 yeah. hours. So I'd be curious to see how that plays into it as well. Absolutely. Well, responsible disclosure news might not be the sexiest of tech news, but I like to talk about it anyway. TechCrunch says that security researchers from Checkpoint have found a bug in Facebook Messenger that could allow an attacker to change the content of our conversations. Now, a malicious hacker could have located identifiers of messages and then added or changed text, photos, files, links, uh, and even changed emojis or stickers, which would totally change some conversations, and then sent the message onto its destination. Checkpoint reported the bug responsibly and uh, Facebook has patched the hole. For its part, Facebook says this was a temporary problem and only people who are part of the original conversation could change it. And this comes on the heels of last week's rumors that Facebook is mulling over optional encryption for Messenger. Now, Brad, are you a regular Facebook Messenger user? You know, to be honest, I'm not. Like, it's I, I use it on occasion, um, sometimes with my wife and whatnot, but there's so many chat applications out there these days. It's like, if you're in a startup world, please don't build another chat app. We need some conden uh, condensing of the environment. But Facebook Messenger, to be honest, for me, works really well when I'm trying to contact that friend I haven't talked to in a very long time. Mm -hmm. And that's primarily when I use it. Otherwise, it's iMessage or Skype or sometimes just plain email. Yeah, I think that I feel that way the same the same way. And it, it, it solves some of those problems because you know who the person is. I mean, that's one of the good things about Facebook. It's it's mostly people are mostly using their real names or real photos. So you don't have that awkward thing that you have in iMessage. And I don't know if you have this in Android uh, where you get a text message from someone and you have no idea who it is. It's just a phone number. And it's like, yeah. I don't know who you are. You always know on Facebook. Yeah, that's that's very true. Um, everybody's focusing on the bad hacker aspect of this. Mm -hmm. Is like a hacker's going to get in there, but like you mentioned, this would only happen if someone that was in your circle that mm -hmm. you were chatting with initially decided to do this. So I like to think of it in the positive way, and maybe they would go in there and they would re replace all the words with like unicorns and 
and rainbows <laughs> and something something I along those lines would. in yeah. which case it's a feature right. as far as i'm concerned <laughs> yeah this is one of those things that it, it, the headline was a little bit clickbaity you know yeah. because they fixed it it was mm -hmm. only a temp they were trying to right. uh, solve a problem with android duplicate messages or something and it was something about identifiers that is beyond what i understand so it was a minor thing but it's one of those things that it's like well thank goodness someone's paying attention every second apparently because this mm -hmm. was very you know quickly that this uh was a hole and then it was patched yep now, last August, uh, Google restructured itself under a new holding company that now not only controls Google and its search efforts, but also all of the other random things that have nothing to do with search. That's Alphabet. Uh, one of those companies is uh, Verily, which once was called uh, Google Life Sciences. It was the Google Life Sciences division of Google. Well, seven former Verily employees paint a pretty dismal picture of the group now, saying essentially that the leadership wants to treat science like the company itself treats computers, and it just doesn't work that way with science. As a result, projects like, uh, you know, they have a couple of projects that they've been public with. One is a medical diagnostic uh, device, kind of like the Star Trek tricoder. Uh, another one that we've heard a lot about are the, the glucose reading contact lenses. Uh, these sources uh, from the inside, they, they don't work there anymore, basically say, you know, these, these items make for great PR for the group, and that's what we all hear about, you know, all these crazy things that Google and this group are doing from a PR perspective. But even inside, they are seen as just that, plainly PR, according to those sources. The reality, it seems, is that uh, hardware and software can do many things, but applying those methods to this type of science and medicine uh, study, all that kind of stuff, isn't proving to be very effective at all. So apparently a big exodus from Verily um, last March it then was also kind of challenge, you know, pointing to a challenging work environment under the CEO, Andrew uh, Conrad. So I don't know. But, but then at the same time, a lot of these things I would imagine will take years to even see to fruition. You know, they, they seem pretty positive that they can do these things, but that it's not an immediate thing. So I don't know. Well, this sort I don't of know how long you have to wait before you start to see some actual product yeah uh when i read this story it reminded me of literally any like biomedical uh sort of thriller film where it's like you have the scientists working and the the pr person or the you know the money person is just like when is that going to be ready when is it going to be ready no don't no just ignore the ethics of it it just go right ahead with those giant robots that will kill all of us uh so yeah that's what it sort of sounded like mm -hmm. uh but yeah, I mean, what we were talking about yesterday with the, the guy from NASA who's starting a project that he's been working on for decades, uh, that that is the way a lot of this should move, slowly and carefully, and not with someone demanding that we get everything uh, immediately right now, especially if it's something that we're going to be putting in our eyeballs. Yeah. What do you think, Brad? So this is, I think this is a more interesting thing about Google uh, or Alphabet, I should say, in general. So we've looked at if you, Alphabet's been in the news a lot, right? They've got uh, the twenty, the Nest kind of drama, whatever you want to call it. They've yeah. got this. I think what we're really, honestly, seeing here, obviously, biomedical uh, research is a completely different game than building uh, like Google Buzz or something, where you can just stand it up and it takes off. Like to your point, if you're, we're putting this in our eyeball. It's got to be really well tested before people are going to do this. But I think what we're seeing inside of Google or Alphabet is actually just a really maturing of the company that they've now broken apart all their business operations. They've got much better clean insight to actually what's going on. And I think the investors are starting to push back internally and saying, hey, we want to see some profitability out of all these ventures that you bought with all the money that you made. And we've seen like Boston Dynamics kind of move away. We've seen the Motorola kind of move away. We're seeing things going on at Nest. There's a rumor of Nest being sold. And then we see this bio life science that's, okay, these are PR things, but are they really helping the bottom line? And I, I think this is just watching Alphabet grow up in front of our eyes is what's going on uh, if you kind of take a step back. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, they, they went from, you know, kind of a culture or a, or a setup where, Google maintained a lot of these things and you didn't really know a lot about them because they weren't as public. That was a big part of the reason why Google did this with Alphabet was to bring some of these projects forward. And, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the Google Life Sciences division kind of operated in pretty much in secret behind closed doors before the whole Alphabet switch happened. And now it's forced out in front of people. And what does that bring? That brings expectations about all of this type of stuff. Um, you know, having said that, 
the, what the picture that they're painting about this particular group with Conrad, you know, CEO Conrad uh, in charge, it sounds like he's a challenge to work for, which I guess you can mm -hmm. kind of understand in these high pressure environments, that would be the case. He's, he's incredibly smart, uh, but that he just really exaggerates, over exaggerates on what uh, Verily could possibly even deliver upon. And that could become a big problem. Uh, a couple of years down the line, especially in light of you know what we've seen with Theranos and mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, yeah, you know when you're much. when you're talking about uh, the, you know the kind of biotech uh, industry and and all this type of stuff, you need that kind of uh, that kind of responsibility takes on a whole other level. Yeah. I think. He would be played by Kevin Spacey in this thriller, <laughs> I'm imagining. Excellent. We'll see when that happens okay. in a couple of years, maybe. Uh, writing in the Daily Dot today, Selena Larson says, we are embarrassed to talk to our devices in public, and she cites a survey to back this up. Research firm Creative Strategies says, of a study of 500 consumers, iPhone users chatted with Siri only 3% uh, of the time in public, uh, whereas Android users talk to their unnamed device 12% of the time, unnamed device assistant. 20% uh, of consumers said they never used a, device, a voice assistant uh, because they said they feel uncomfortable talking to their technology, especially in public. Now, Brad, I know you use a few different smartphones. Uh, which yep. of those do you talk to? And do you, you know, do it in public? This is a really interesting question. So the thing I talk to most in my house is actually my Echo from Amazon. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually really buy into the study. So when I'm in public, um, I use, I, you know, we have an iPhone. The only thing I ever use Siri for is to set reminders, is to say, hey, at 11 p.m. do X or, you know, at 6 p.m. do Z. That's really about it, mostly because I don't trust it enough to get the proper result that I need. Like a lot of times I'll ask it for things and it it gets close enough, but if you ask for that obscure thing, like you need directions, like that's not something you can just kind of get close. It has to be exact. So you end up just typing it in. I wonder if the people that they surveyed almost had the same sentiment that, yeah, this talking to your phone is good, but it's still not perfect. And that might be playing into it as well. But am I embarrassed to talk to my phone in public? I don't think so anymore. I think people understand what you're doing but I, I can totally see why people don't, though. Yeah, I mean, even myself, and I, I consider myself very open to the idea of voice control and all this kind of stuff. You do that Google a lot now, in the office. Like, yeah, I mean, and I, I mean, very much like what you're saying, Brad. A lot of times, it's remind you know reminders for something. Or remind me tomorrow, you know, uh, whatever the command. Suddenly, it's it's escaping me. But remind me tomorrow at eight to water the plants, or I don't know, whatever it happens yep. to be. I do that all the time, and actually. Like it's it's a lifesaver for me. Without it, I find that a lot of things slip through the through the cracks. So I'm happy to have that. But when I'm out on the sidewalk, like walking down the sidewalk, I can think of many times where I was about to do a voice command, but I didn't because I was going to cross paths with somebody, and I waited to cross paths, and then I did it. Just and I don't even know that I realized that I was doing that, but it was just specifically to avoid any sort of you know that look that like. <laughs> You know, because you're it, talking to your phone is different, and I think it's perceptively different than uh, talking to somebody on the phone. Yeah. You know, it's just a different delivery. Yeah, you sometimes do. I mean, I've sat next to you for a year and a half, and mm -hmm. on occasion, you I've heard you remind yourself. So I, I've gotten to used to your, I'm talking to you, Megan voice, and I'm talking to, <laughs> you're like, what? okay, Google. What are you going to do tomorrow? <laughs> what do you want me to oh, this has nothing to do with me. Why okay. are you telling me to remind you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's interesting, and you, it's interesting you brought up the Echo because we talk a lot about like this the rise of uh, the Amazon Echo in, in the U.S. where it's only um, available now. But it, maybe it is because people really only feel comfortable talking to their devices right now in their home. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about this, the fact that the device is in the home. Um, I was listening to uh, Tom Merritt and uh, Veronica Belmont on the Daily Tech News show yesterday. They were talking about how both of their spouses don't like Alexa. Like that was an issue. And my husband doesn't like Alexa either. Hmm. Uh, Brad, do you have that issue? Do both of you talk to Alexa? Oh, we, we have no issue. Like it's <laughs> You're like you and your, honest, you have a healthy relationship. Our okay. daughter's figured out how to control it. <laughs> so we'll be listening to a song and she'll go up to and say, Alexa, next song. And regardless <laughs> if she likes the song or not. Well, okay. Maybe this is too personal of a story, but my, my husband doesn't really like, he's not a, you know, he's not a Luddite, but he doesn't love technology, but I left to go to work and I came back in, like he wasn't expecting me. And he was talking, he was like asking Alexa to play <gasps> a song. And I had this moment of like, 
jealous. Like, it was like, oh, you do talk to her, but just not when I'm around. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> And Did you I, have a talk with him afterwards? No, just right there. We, I handled it right All there. All right, Alexa, stop. <laughs> We're going to talk about this. Yeah. <laughs> I kid, but I think there is something to be said about talking to our devices. There's uh, more here. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay, so uh, today's question of the day for you out there is, do you talk to your device in public? Tell us why or why not. Uh, and what device you talk to, you can email us at tnt at twit.tv. Uh, we are hoping to read your answers on the show. Yes, love to hear what you guys have to say. Do you have guilt when <laughs> you find your significant other is talking to Alexa? Let us know. Or Siri, or uh, Google Or Cortana. I mean, that was my or question Cortana. for you, Brad. I mean, you also have... you. Do you talk to Cortana? I mean, this is a big deal. We talked about this yesterday because Cortana's coming to the Xbox. Mm -hmm. So she will be yeah, at home so too. We had a really interesting conversation actually with a couple different people. I asked them how often they talked to Cortana on their PC. And universally, it was almost never. So I'll be I'll be curious to see how it works with the Xbox. I have like screamed at my Xbox a few times because they, it does have, uh, you know, rudimentary uh, voice control and Cortana will improve upon that. But I, no, I don't really talk to Cortana, and I actually think this is a bigger in issue inside of Microsoft. Um, I've heard that they were expecting a lot more voice and interaction with Cortana uh, mm -hmm. when it launched, and they're not really seeing that on the back end. And I don't blame them. Like, I don't blame people. Like, I don't like to talk to my my desktop, of all things. Right. Uh, talking to your smartphone is a little bit different, but no, I don't talk to Cortana a lot. I mean, I use the, the contextual features where it surfaces stuff for me, which is nice, but no. I, I don't really talk to Cortana too much. Yeah, and there is a difference between talking to your desktop versus your phone. Like, I feel like yeah. you're, and maybe the, I don't know why that is. You know, maybe it's marketing around well, you, the feature or whatever. To to you yeah, on I suppose your phone. so. Yeah, right. but I mean, they put they put Google Now uh, integration, you know, voice search capability into Google, you know, on Chrome OS and whatever, and it's been there forever. And I think I've used it once to mm -hmm. test it out and go, oh yeah, it totally does work. But I, meanwhile, I use Google Now on my phone all the time. You know, mm -hmm. Google Voice entry there. Uh, you used to have to wait in virtual line in order to get an HTC Vive, but HTC now promises the VR system will ship within three days of purchase. Pre-orders through retail partners will be hitting consumers' hands starting this week. So basically the news is no more pre-order waits. If you want an HTC Vive, you can get one right away. And Brad, I know you have an HTC Vive. What are your thoughts on I this? I do. I do. And it's, um, you know... It's, it's an interesting device. And if you've never done VR, I would I, I hesitate, to be honest, to tell people to buy these things because I, I love, I mean, I love this thing. It's great. I've used it. Um, when we got it, my wife was like, oh, that's the dumbest thing ever. And she put it on and then she played with it for almost 90 minutes straight and didn't nice. even realize it. But it's still, this is very much in its infancy. There's not a lot of content for it. It's 800 bucks. Uh, it, it's for somebody who's pretty tech novice, it's a lot to set up. I mean, I was a little overwhelmed by I mean, all the wires and all the cubes you got to put in the corners. Then there's controllers you got to sync up. And my controller initially didn't sync, so I had to troubleshoot it. And then you, on top of that, you need a $1,500 PC. With that being said, it's a lot of fun. Um, if you can find the right thing you're looking for. And so if you're on the edge, think about what you're going to use it for. If you're buying this thing for gaming, I honestly don't recommend it yet for gaming. Wait a little bit longer. If you're getting this to go, uh, there's a, like for experiences, like if you want to go through like exploring the solar system or you want to go to a different world and like walk around and just kind of be immersed, then it's great. But I, I'm happy that HTC, there's no longer any wait because I waited a few months to get mine. But for the casual user who's on the fence, I honestly would say just keep waiting a little bit until we get some more content before you, you splash down the cash on one of these things. And that goes for Oculus as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I guess I won't be getting one anytime soon. It's okay. We have one in the back room. And you haven't used it yet. I know. I know. <laughs> it's I right need next to. to your office. I need, you know what I need more than, than VR? Time. I need time. Mm -hmm. That's what I need. Yeah. HTC time. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up soon. Uh, up next, Brad will help us unpack a few Microsoft stories. But before that, let's take a minute to thank PillPack, the sponsor of this episode. PillPack is a full-service online pharmacy. It'll make you wonder why you ever settled for a traditional pharmacy. It actually kind of changes your thoughts on pharmacies in general. With PillPack, 
You'll never have to wait around for your prescriptions. You'll never have to sort your pills, chase down your doctors for refills. All that stuff is out the window. Their pharmacists take care of everything for you. PillPack uses advanced technology to sort all of your medications and vitamins by the date and time for each dose. You can also order inhalers, uh, creams, and diabetes supplies, uh, which come refrigerated, easy to open packages, uh, shipping's always free, and their pharmacists are always available 24 7 so that you can speak with them from the privacy of your home or if you happen to be on the go. PillPack has truly designed their pharmacy to make your life easier and have very quickly disrupted the pharmacy industry. What's great is that PillPack's compatible with most major insurance plans, including most forms of Medicare Part D, and their service is free. That means you only pay the copays set by your insurance provider. So just definitely check this out. It's going to make your life a heck of a lot easier. Here's what I want you to do. Visit pillpack.com slash twit to sign up now. It only takes five minutes to get started. And when you use our link and transfer your prescriptions to PillPack, you're going to get a credit for $20 worth of vitamins and OTCs. That's pillpack.com slash T-W-I-T. And we thank PillPack for their support of Tech News Today. I am an avid user of Wonderlist. It's a to-do app. It's my Wunderlist. favorite. Wunderlist. I, I, I don't know if it's that, but uh, you can you can pronounce okay, it that Wunder. way. Uh, I love it, and I've used many. Um, I love to-do lists. I'm very good at making to-do lists. Much better than doing the things on the to-do list. <laughs> uh, so almost a year ago to this date, Microsoft announced that they had purchased Wonderlist, and you, Brad, got your hands on a new to-do app from Microsoft. Uh, is it the new Wonderlist? What can you tell us about it? So okay. So let, what is it's called? It's called Project Cheshire. And I feel like I should have like a, a little teacup and some crumpets. Yeah. And well, yes, well, I'm announced while well, I'm like saying that name. And what this is, and we don't know the, where in the product life cycle this is, but it, it's a to-do list app. And it is very, very basic. I mean, you can add an item, you can set a reminder, and you can mark it as complete. And then there's basic lists that you can lay out. And that's really about it. And so you can't download this yet, and I don't know when it's coming. And there's a couple things that are going on. So obviously Microsoft has Wonderlist, and people are, are wondering, how does this play into it? So we don't know if this is just an early adaptation of Wonderlist that's eventually going to get rebranded, um, or, or this app will get, you know, the Project Cheshire will go to Wonderlist, and once it's feature complete, be ready for everyone. But it's definitely made its way out of the confines of Microsoft as this kind of in-process product and I, I got my hands on it, played around with it, and created a couple lists, and we don't really know what it is. So there's a couple other different things that we can think about. Microsoft yesterday announced Office 365 Planner. There's also um, Outlook Tasks that could all tie into this. So we don't quite know if this is a wonder list replacement or where this is or how they're going to factor it in, but it's definitely relatively well polished for where it is. So this is kind of a... a an interesting thing because we can't I can't imagine Microsoft abandoning Wonderlist after they just bought it and uh, at the time of acquisition they said they had 13 million active users so I don't know Microsoft throw us a bone here what are you going to use this project Cheshire Cheshire for is it its own thing or is it what I really think I think it's a part of something else that is coming down the pipe I hope so, because that's ugly. Hmm. Like, part of what I like oh, about yeah. Wonderlist is got beautiful pictures in the back. It's just a nice-looking app um, on my iPhone. Yeah, it, but that is, like, really wait. Is, Wonderlist is great. And that, yeah. That, so that's interesting. I mean, that is a very fancy name for such a bland-looking to do this <laughs> program. <laughs> yeah, that's why I think we're I, – I think I got a hold of it a little early, and maybe it's coming down. Or possibly they got feedback that people just want the most basic bare-bones app – and so I can't imagine this product took a long time to build. And so maybe somebody just stood one up real quick and they're going to do some market research to see if people really just want that absolute basic feature. I don't know. Yeah, because when it comes to task lists, like I, the, I mean, the, I use two. I use Evernote for my really complicated like notes, you know, long mm -hmm. you know, notes about this, that, and the other thing. And then I use Keep for my daily like to-do list, task list. And this actually reminds me a lot of Keep. In, in functionality, not necessarily mm -hmm. in kind of the look, because I think Keep, you know, is a little bit more built out as far as kind of the graphical aspect of it. But I, I appreciate Keep because it's kind of pared down and because it's relatively simple for the most part. So 
Now, could you see any integration with Cortana in that? Because that that's where I feel like, you know, you were talking, Jason, earlier about, like, remind me to do whatever, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, yeah. That's what I love. Uh, you know, I think that, I know Amazon Echo, well, you can add things to your to-do list. Yep. And then, um, so it would be great to have some, I mean, I could see how integrating it with Cortana would make sense. Did you see any hints of that? So it... It, I do. I mean, I, I think that's going to be a natural point. Actually, when I open the app without doing anything, it already logged me into my Microsoft account, which tells me that the backend services are all piped together, which is what Cortana is using. So in theory, the framework is already there. They just have to enable the functionality. And so it should work. I think that would make a lot of sense for helping pull content out of Cortana. Although considering our prior conversation that people aren't using these voice assistants like we think, maybe that's not such a good idea. I don't know. We'll see how it plays out for the company. Now, would you ever see like the Xbox turning into Microsoft's Amazon Echo? Like the, the a device like that that's, you know, in your living room already, you're talking to it. Maybe it also has your to-do list. You can watch TV. <laughs> so this is a really good, I, I had a couple good scoops uh, right before I went on vacation. So pay attention to E3. I think we're going to see some new hardware out of Microsoft that is going to be more in the living room that's not so much just a console. Okay. That's all you can say for now. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't want to give away. I mean, I know some more details, but I'm not really sure. But I think there's going to be a lot of hardware. We're going to see a smaller Xbox. Um, but I actually think they're going to come out with more lower end hardware because they don't have a low end play that competes with the Apple TV or Google Chromecast. Mm. So they're they're missing that crucial price point right now. And I think we're going to see something come in around that price. Right. I know. I think we quoted your uh, podcast when you had that scoop. You said it was going to be maybe the size of about a, a little bit smaller than a lunchbox. So we're, we're hearing that there's two devices in the works. I don't know what they're going to show, but there's definitely one that's actually the size of about a Chromecast. Think a little bit about that size. And then there's another device that's about the size of an NVIDIA Shield. Um, and what device they're going to announce and if they're going to hold anything for later for the year, I'm not quite sure. But they're all definitely kind of in that Xbox media streaming uh, component of Microsoft in that division. So I'll be, I'm going to be watching very closely to see what they announce. And they actually hinted uh, in this upcoming release that they announced for this summer with the Cortana and all that integration of other, if you kind of look through all the details, there's, there's hints of other hardware support coming for those types of apps and services, which I think ties into this media type device. Because you think about it, Microsoft doesn't have an Apple TV competitor. They, they used to have, their closest thing to it was actually the Xbox 360, which was very cheap, but they killed production of that. So right now, their cheapest device is actually uh, $299, which is way out of the league of somebody who's buying a Roku or an Apple TV. And Microsoft has media services. They've got Groove, they've got um, video streaming, they've got an app store, but they have no way to effectively get that into the living room at a lower price point than what they offer now. And so they've got to fill that void because if they lose the living room, uh, which, you know, Roku and Google and Apple are kind of eating their lunch with the Xbox, uh, what Xbox started, they're missing out. And they're once again going to be late to this, but I think we're going to see something in that segment uh, here announced in what, about a week or so. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move on to Windows 10. We're coming up on the deadline to download and install Windows 10 for free. That marks about a year of people complaining that Microsoft is pushing the update too hard and also complaining that Microsoft is tracking you and there's no way to get rid of it. Uh, now an industrious Windows user named Todd Kleinpaste has started a change.org petition to ask the EFF to investigate Windows 10 for malicious practices. Uh, what do you make of this, Brad? So, you know, I've got, I've, I've, I can see both sides of this equation. So let's take it from, from this petition side, right? This is, Microsoft has never in their history prior, well, I should say what most people remember is Microsoft has never been this aggressive. Remember, they got in a lot of trouble many, many years ago for essentially pushing uh, Netscape out of the market. Now, people are kind of associating that aggressiveness to what they're doing with Windows 10. And... I, I agree. Microsoft is being very aggressive about this and they're being annoying, right? They want market share. They want Windows 10 on everything and they're going to do everything possible they can to get your machine to upgrade. So I agree with the petition that says, hey, Microsoft has never done this. They're kind of being bullish about it. They're going to get this on your machine at the best way possible. So from that aspect, is that is that a an offense that Microsoft should be fined for significantly? Um, kind of the way that the EFF or the government or EU or whoever would go after them? I don't really agree with that side of it. I mean, 
first off, it's free. Microsoft has made it well known that they want you to run this. Um, what I think would get them out of this is if they made it, I guess they give you 30 days to roll back to Windows 7. I think that's kind of their out and no data loss or whatever. But I, I don't see this as an offense like they did with Netscape or the, where they're using their monopolistic capabilities to do this. So I, I think this is one of those things where users are frustrated. Microsoft hasn't done a great job of communicating certain things. But are they going to get fined a billion dollars for this? I don't. I don't necessarily see that happening. Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't think so either. <laughs> it's just interesting. I think it says a lot about like just our corporate opinion of Microsoft over the years, uh, and people always thinking that they're out to get us. When I, I don't believe that that is necessarily true. But yeah, it's. I also think we're also been stuck. So that Microsoft has this really kind of two-sided opinion about things, right? They want the enterprise to run all their software. The enterprise, as we all know, is a very slow moving beast. So they got mm -hmm. stuck in this model of slow upgrades. You can keep the software for five years. It's actually supported for 15 years, but after five years, we'll have a new version. And now they're in this rapid fire mode and they have to get, they have to retrain their user. They have to retrain the user that you're not gonna upgrade once every five years. You're gonna upgrade every year. And I, that's what the, I think that's the struggle we're seeing is people are used to Microsoft of, of you know, the mid 2000s, and that's not their business model anymore. Mm -hmm. hmm. And so they're upset, right or wrong. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. Excellent stuff. Uh, let's uh, take a look at some feedback that we got from the show. TNT at twit.tv. Matthias Schultz wrote in to say if Elon Musk is correct and we are living in a large virtual reality game, then we need to immediately stop talking about how to overthrow our robotic overlords. The reason for this is very simple. If I am a despotic robotic overlord, it's kind of hard to say, then I would string up a bunch of humans, Matrix style, and run simulations to have them brainstorm all the ways I could be overthrown. I could then set up countermeasures to eternally frustrate and finally defeat the few free humans hiding in the Earth's core. For the sake of these free humans, we need to stop thinking about helping the despotic robotic overlords. Please, of course, if we are not living in a large virtual reality game, then ignoring the singularity will leave us unprotected. My head hurts. I think I should binge watch uh, some Simpsons. That's probably a good, good way to go because my head hurts too. But I like the I like the ring of the despotic robotic overlords, and I think you're probably right. It is really my goal to say the phrase "robotic overlords" at least <laughs> at one time in every show. And speaking of those robotic <laughs> overlords, uh, do they have ethics? They should. But first, let's take a minute to thank Trunk Club, the sponsor of this episode. There are two types of men out there, guys who love shopping for clothes but are short on time, and those of you who hate it. Either way, take heart. Now you can get clothes that fit perfectly and look amazing without ever having to step into a store again. What? Thank you, Trunk Club. Just type in your measurements, share your likes and your dislikes, and your personal stylist will help you look and feel your best with clothes that fit you perfectly. Uh, your stylist is a trained professional, trained in all the brands that Trunk Club offers, but there's so much more to Trunk Club than that. They'll pick your clothes from over 80 top brands and ship them right to your door. Keep what you like. Send back what you don't. Your stylist takes the time to understand your unique look. And if you live in Dallas, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, or D.C., you can stop by one of the Trunk Club clubhouses to work with your stylist in person. And Trunk Club is not just for men. There is a woman's version, too. I have gotten it. I really like the stuff that they sent. And the stuff I didn't like, I just sent back. Trunk Club is not a subscription service. Shipping is always free, and you have 10 days to try on the clothes. So make a statement at your next big event on your calendar with a look that's handpicked just for you and your style. Get started at Trunk Club today. Premium clothes, expert advice, no work, thanks to your very own personal stylist at Trunk Club. And Trunk Club is backed by Nordstrom, which means they have the highest standards in quality and customer service. Get started right now at trunkclub.com slash TNT. That's trunkclub.com slash TNT. And we thank Trunk Club for their support. All right. So autonomous vehicles will have a lot on their robotic minds, their despotic robotic minds in the near future. <laughs> or whenever they are actually occupying the road in any great numbers. Joining us to talk about the ethical aspects of autonomous vehicles is Jesse Kirkpatrick, uh, Assistant Director of the Institute of Philosophy and Public Policy at George Mason University. Welcome. Great, thank you. 
It's great to have you here. So first things first, uh, set the stage here. You start your piece on Slate uh, by painting kind of a moral dilemma involving, let's say, our self-driving truck that we're in that must decide whether to take the fender bender in front of it or to verge into another lane and in doing so might potentially harm a motorcyclist on either side. I, I kind of get the feeling that this scenario is mild compared to some of the other ethical choices that we're going to face in this new world of autonomous vehicles. What do you think? So in the piece, I lay out what is a thought experiment, as you as you noted. Um, we have a truck in front of us. Let's imagine that we're driving a large passenger vehicle, say a Volvo with very high safety ratings. To our left is a motorcyclist who's wearing a helmet. To the right is a motorcyclist who isn't. Now, autonomous vehicles, is they're going to crash. It's a matter of statistical probability, a uh, matter of physics. The question then becomes, um, what should they be programmed to do when, in fact, they do crash? So the, the thought experiment here is a way to kind of underlie some of the ethical issues that programmers need to think about as they move forward in writing the algorithms that are going to govern these crashes, and then how we think about these algorithms as consumers and users of these, of these autonomous vehicles in the future. And what you're talking about here is something that you call in the article, or I'm sure it was a terminology that was dubbed that you were pulling from, but crash optimization. Explain that kind of that idea a little bit. Yeah, it's 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 kind of an odd term, but um, crash optimization is is simply the idea self-driving vehicles are going to crash, just like just like cars that we drive ourselves. Um, and what crash optimization seeks to do is it seeks to reduce the harm or injury that is going to occur as a result of a crash. So we can think of it as kind of optimizing the reduction of harm. Mm -hmm. um Oh, did you have a question? I, I did. So I've read studies that say uh, that people, when they're driving and they see a motorcyclist uh, who's not wearing a helmet, they'll be safer around around that cyclist. That that you know, it's not not saying to telling people, you know, if you're riding a motorcycle, don't wear a helmet because people will be safer around <laughs> you. But there's this. It's, that's a very human thing. It's like, oh, I see that motorcyclist has no helmet. I'm going to be safer uh, than I would if the, if someone I'd be. I'll be more dangerous. I might cut off someone if they're wearing a. A, a, a helmet. I mean, is there a way to program a self-driving car to have that same kind of logic? Um, so the idea is that yes, there will be at some point in the future. The question is, is, um, is what the programming ought to be. So as we know uh, from, from the sensors that currently exist in self-driving cars, um, the high definition cameras, uh, that they that they're going to be able to make those distinctions as they're being brought to market. That is the differentiation between, say, someone who is wearing a helmet and someone who isn't. The question here is that that um, what we ought to do. So, the the way that I articulate it in the thought experiment is as follows. So we have this truck, right? Um, let's imagine that a box falls off the truck, and you have three discrete choices. They're all zero sum options. They're all going to result in a in a car crash. Um, but here they are. The first is is that you proceed along and you and you crash into this box, right? As I said, you're driving a, a car with high safety ratings, so you're probably going to be okay. You'll be mildly injured, slightly injured. Um, your car might be messed up a little bit, but you're going to be fine, right? Now we have the motorcyclist on the left, and let's imagine that she is not wearing a helmet, right? The one on the right is wearing a helmet, and we know that as a matter of statistical probability, the rider wearing the helmet has a higher likelihood of surviving if she if she's struck as opposed to the one who isn't now we may say that that the so we have three choices one that is that um let's say that it's almost almost certain that the the rider without a helmet is going to be severely injured if not killed you driving in your in your car hitting the box are probably going to be okay um and, and then the rider with the helmet is going to be comparatively better than the one who isn't wearing a helmet but be, but worse off than you now the question is so what what is it that we ought to do now our our gut might tell us that we should reduce harm right that we should reduce harm to the motorcyclists and um to ourselves but in this scenario the greatest harm reduction is going to be us taking one for the team and crashing our vehicle into the box. But the problem here is that um, if you're anything like me or I tend to suspect most people, you're going to be really reluctant to buy a car that is going to be programmed to 
sacrifice your well-being and safety <laughs> in situations such as those. Uh, you can compound it with the fact that imagine if you have your child in the back seat, right? Um, that's an even more unsettling thought. So maybe we go with the motorcyclist, right? because the idea is that we want people, if self-driving cars are going to be as safe as we think they may be, um, then we want people to adopt them, right? That you know, uh, car crashes in the United States kill about as many people that, a year that would fill Fenway Park, right? That's my hometown team, uh, over 35,000 people a year. That's a lot of people. So saving, saving people by adopting self-driving cars would be a net good. Now the question is, what do we do with the motorcyclist. There seems to be something unfair about penalizing a helmeted motorcyclist by striking her as opposed to the person that isn't wearing a helmet. I myself am a motorcyclist, and I tell you, when I, when I strap on my helmet, um, as a matter of law and as a matter, I think, of common sense, uh, I, would, I would be deeply unsettled if I knew that, that these self-driving cars were programmed algorithmically to strike huh. helmeted motorcyclists, right. which may result in me not wearing a helmet and, uh, and you know, putting myself at, at greater risk. So these are the types of, the types of issues that are, that are facing programmers as they start to think about it. And that's why it's so important to, to uh, combine the kind of the tech folks with people who do philosophy and public policy like myself and my colleagues. Absolutely. I mean, to some extent, we're already making these decisions. Like I, I am, you know, I drive a minivan. People drive big cars because they're safer for themselves and their family. So I, I, I never really, I didn't think of, think about it. Like, oh, I'm driving this big safe car because I only care about myself. But that is sort of what we're thinking about. But, but when you, I mean, we're not thinking about subconsciously doing it. So is the problem then that we, someone has to actually, there has to be a person programming these things that we don't necessarily always like to think about? Well, I think that's part of it. I think what it does is that um, that driving is, you know, that that drivers have faced have faced the risk of accidents since since automobiles have existed. Um, but the difference here is that the types of accidents that we face are we're faced with split second decisions, right? So just uh, this past Saturday, I was I was driving along. I had just gotten a parking ticket. I was, you know, I was paying attention, but. Um, the, consequently, I, I hit a pothole and, uh, and and blew a tire. It happened in a second, you know, half a second. I had no time to react, right? Um, I've been in other accidents in which it's a it's a gut instinct, a split second decision. I don't turn on my car and think before I go down and get a gallon of milk. I don't think um, right, now. What are the ethical implications of me driving? What if? Uh, two pedestrians run out in the crosswalk and I have to make a decision between swerving and not swerving and so on and so forth. Well, what self-driving cars do is that they take decisions that were once these gut gut instinct, split second decisions um, that were made in the driver's seat. They take them and they move them to sort of the comfort of the office chair or the philosopher's armchair or the engineering engineer's chair behind the computer. So what they do is they, they provide us with situations that we've faced forever, but now they give us the opportunity to reflect on them ethically with the kind of cool remove that we have when we're not faced with these split second heat of the moment decisions. When I hear this stuff, um, just more and more like it just makes me wonder if this is even doable because there's just there's so many layers of moral and ethical kind of complications involved here like i don't know if there's ever a point that you get to where someone can say okay that's the right decision right uh brad what do you think about all this i mean does this give you hope for a future of autonomous vehicles i mean obviously this is important work that's being done to think through these things uh do you think it's feasible what do you think, Brad? So I, I kind of have a question for Jesse here. So yeah. do you see this decision tree model being standardized uh, by potentially by the government? The, the reason why I say that is if if it's manufacturer dependent, we'll, we could eventually see stories like where a Ford algorithm kills more people than a Tesla. I mean, that, that's kind of an interesting thought that yeah, we'll have safety ratings, but then we're also going to have kill ratings if it's not some sort of standardized decision tree model among autonomous vehicles. Right. So, um, so one option is that that I think that you present is that we have um, that the potential risk with not standardizing these types of of decision trees um, is that you have kind of these sort of competitive 
competitive competing algorithmic decisions that that occur um, I'm actually not sure that it's going to be regulated to the extent to which uh, in which it's in which it's uniform um, what I do think will happen as a as a first step or at least what I what I argue for in the piece and what I hope happens um, at the very least and this this isn't to suggest that this is a uh, this is a replacement or a substitute for regulation um, well, what I argue in the piece is that uh, that we should at the very least have um, full disclosure and transparency in reasonable and plain language um, so that when I know that I'm getting into my car and I have the, you know, I have the wherewithal or the desire to learn about what the programming is behind it, I have the opportunity and the access to the information. Uh, the risk here, of course, is that, um, is that we all know that these types of, that, that corporations and manufacturers and tech companies um, don't make it very easy to figure out you know, what they're doing with data or what the ethical alg algorithm is going to be. I mean, take a look at iTunes user agreement. Um, and if you're anything like me, as your, you, you know, as an update comes through, you're going to scroll to the bottom, hit I consent, <laughs> I agree, without reading a single word of the thing. So I think that, um, I think the, the, this is a way to, to, um, this isn't directly answering your, your question. And I understand that, but, uh, I think that, um, it remains to be seen. Well, isn't isn't that sorry, Brad? Do you have another question? Well, I, I guess it, it, the follow on, and then that's probably the last one. I, I could probably talk to you for a couple hours about this, but <laughs> um, so let's let's kind of go down the devious route with coding here. I mean, I've I've got a fair bit of programming knowledge in my my background. So, what happens if something comes out to where it can be pinpointed to an engineer who made a coding mistake that the algorithm failed in a scenario and chose the wrong option? I guess there would have to be some sort of legal disclaimer, but let's say like it, it fails and it drives the van, the minivan of five kids off a cliff rather than hitting the telephone pole. Right. So, um, so this is a whole other a whole other issue, and the one that you that you raise, which is one of um, of uh, uh, legal legal responsibility and liability, right? right? Um, and yeah, sure um, yeah. and right. So that's the other. So so I've written a number of pieces like this, and um, and every time I get contacted by all of these insurance companies to discuss the potential implications <laughs> of it. Um, and so again, I think that it is. Um, I think that that we're sort of in the in the first stages of. Um, not of developing this technology, right? Because I, I mean, I've I've um, been a passenger in, in Tesla's autopilot and um, and taken it for a spin, and so so the technology is is coming quickly. But what we are in the beginning stages of is um, figuring out these questions like liability, uh, regulation, insurance models and schemes. Uh, so I you know I I have some of my own views on it. I think that it's likely that the that the companies will. Um, Will find ways in which to to limit their legal liability, um, probably through probably either through direct legislation um, or lobbying efforts. Uh, it, it I think it just remains to be seen. Yeah, a lot remains Absolutely. to be seen, and, and especially how long the time you know the time span of this is going to take to play out. It seems like there's a lot of complications, so it's going to be a little while. Uh, Jesse Kirkpatrick, really appreciate you coming on the show and uh, talking with us about this. It's a fascinating topic. Uh, tell people where they can follow your work online. Well, the best way is to is to follow me on on Twitter, or you can check out our uh, our institute's website, which is ippp.gmu.edu. All right, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Take care. Okay, thanks, guys. Alrighty. TNT's fan of the day is at Noble Ackerson, who says, "I cast on the telly and watch Megan Maroney and Jason Howell high five each other." Uh, I am guessing that's it. Uh, Noble fast forwards to the point at which we high five, plays it, and then is empowered to do things like work out and research wearable devices. Uh, it sort of looks like we're we might be hitting each other over the head with hammers or axes. I promise it's a high five. Okay. As far as I as far as I can remember, anyways. I don't know if I was hit over the head with an axe, I might not remember things correctly. But I like how it's blurry, and you don't know. Yes. Some days it's high five, some days it's axes. <laughs> <laughs> Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook, and use the hashtag How I Watch TNT, and we will find it. All right, coming up, fish can spit, and their target might be your face. But first. 
Let's take a minute to thank Blue Apron, the sponsor of this episode. That's going to keep you around. I know it. Uh, Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone while supporting a more sustainable food system, uh, setting the highest standards for ingredients, and also building a community of home chefs. For less than $10 per serving, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with fresh, high-quality ingredients uh, to make delicious home-cooked meals. That's what it's all about. Each meal comes with a step-by-step easy to follow uh, recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients that can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. You can actually customize your recipes every week based on your dietary preferences and choose a delivery option that fits your specific needs. There's no weekly commitment, so you only get deliveries when you want them. Blue Apron delivers to 99% of the continental U.S., and Blue Apron sets the highest quality standards for their community of over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the U.S. Seafoods source sustainably, beefs raised humanely, chickens are free range, pork is raised naturally, regenerative farming practices are used for their produce. By shipping the exact amount required for the recipe, Blue Apron uh, does away with kind of the food waste aspect of things. You eat everything uh, because it's all part of the meal. Whether it's Japanese ramen noodles, wild caught uh, Alaskan salmon, or heirloom tomatoes, Blue Apron brings you the very best. Blue Apron not only supports a more sustainable food system, it supports happy and healthy families. Cooking together builds strong family bonds. Research shows that Blue Apron families cook nearly three times more often. New recipes are created each and every week by Blue Apron's culinary team and are not repeated within the year. So it keeps things really, not only is the food fresh, but the recipes are fresh too. Cook meals like spicy Korean rice cakes with snow peas and pea shoots or New England style salmon rolls with roasted potatoes and chives. I've had that one before actually, it's awesome. Check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twit. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron, so do not wait. Visit blueapron.com slash twit and check it out for yourself. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Today. The Verge reports that a new science study and scientific reports shows that fish can recognize people's faces. How do they know this? They asked them. No, they didn't really ask them. They know this because they used archer fish for the study, and archer fish spit streams of water at insects in order to knock the insects off branches. Uh, the researchers showed the fish pictures of different faces and rewarded the fish when they spit at the face that they remembered. I think we have the video, and we can watch those fish spitting right now. <laughs> ah, it just it spat on their face. Why'd you do that, fish? I thought you were our friend, fish. So this is fascinating to me um, that fish can recognize people's faces. Crows can also remember Weird. people's faces. Uh, animals do amazing things. Uh, uh. Brad, what's your take <laughs> on the fish spitting? I want to know what the guy cleaning the screen puts on his LinkedIn for that skill. <laughs> <laughs> squeegee, fish spit squeegee guy. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's a definitely one-off search for whoever whoever has that job. <laughs> uh, I want to know what what uh, these faces did to upset the fish. I mean, seriously, no kidding. <laughs> they were rewarded for spitting on the okay, right. Okay, all right. There's all right, not. There's fine. no. There's these aren't malicious fish we're talking about. They're just trying to help. We're worried about robot overlords <laughs> taking over. We should be worried about the fish. <laughs> Well, Brad, thank you so much for joining us uh, to talk about all the tech news and the fish spitting. Uh, what what are you working on that uh, we can uh, tell people about? You know, so the best, I'm always uh, available on Petri.com and I also run throughout the executive editor for both. And just finding me on Twitter at BD Sams is really just the best way to get in contact. And, you know, it's a lot of fun. I appreciate being here and you guys have a like, good thing going. Oh, thanks, Brad. Right. It's and a, where can people pleasure. find your po podcast? That's uh, so my podcast, you can just find it on uh, SoundCloud or on Throt. It's just called The Sam's Report. Very creative name. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> you've got you've got upgrades going to your studio. So The Sam's Report is suddenly yeah, going to be I mean, filled uh, with lasers. Don't and... get used to this look. It um, hopefully within the next four weeks, this will all be torn down, and we'll have a much more professional looking setup and camera and mics and everything will be uh, getting a little bit of a as Beyonce called it, getting an upgrade. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I don't know uh, from experience if Beyonce said that, but I will trust you. <laughs> it's a d good DirecTV commercial. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much, uh, Brad. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you soon.
All right, TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 12 a.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can always take part in the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv and make sure and let us know if you use voice assistance uh, in public or if that kind of weirds you out, tnt at twit.tv. You can also leave us, us your answer on a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. And finally, you can find the show on Twitter. We are at Tech News Today TV. We're also on Google Play, uh, Music, iTunes, Chromecast, Apple TV. You know how to find us. You know. Subscribe to the newsletter also, twit.tv slash newsletter. If you want to find me on Twitter, I'm at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. Thanks to our technical director, Kara Cole, to Greg for the words on the screen, and everyone else that helps us produce this show every single day. And thanks to you for talking tech with us. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone.